I was very much struck by how the translation of the biblical writings jump-started the development of literacy across the entire world. Illiteracy was the norm. The pastor's home was the first school, yeah. and every morning it would begin with singing. The Christian faith is a singing religion. Probably 80% of scripture memorization today exists only because of what is sung. This is amazing. Here we have a Gutenberg Bible, Bible printed on the press of Johann Gutenberg. Science and religion are opposing forces in the world, but historically that has not been the case. Now the book is available to everyone. From Shakespeare to modern education and medicine and science to, to civilization itself. It is the most influential book in all of history, and hopefully people can walk away with at least a sense of that. If this is what's going on with colleges and if they're controlling working professionals so that the working professionals have to work in a way that isn't truthful, I mean, how do you even fight, how do you fight back against that? At what point do you just stop playing in that game? You know, people have asked me that too. Why don't you just give up your license? And I would say, well, because I wouldn't be giving it up. I would be allowing it to be taken away from me. Like if I decide in a year that I don't want to be a licensed clinical psychologist because the whole damn profession has become corrupt, that's a whole different issue than letting this pack of craven commissar cowards utilize the complaints of random people online to justify their own envy and desire to prosecute and then fold in the face of that opposition. It's like, I'm not going to do that. The only thing you have in a complex situation is the truth. That's all you have. That's why you have to abide by the truth, you know, because when things get complex around you, all you have there that's solid ground is the truth. And so the reason you abide by the truth is so that you can say what you have to say about what you've done and who you are, and you can do that under impossibly difficult circumstances, and possibly that will sustain you through that. Hello, everybody watching and listening on YouTube and perhaps on the Daily Wire Plus platform. I'm being, I'm having a discussion today with my daughter, Michaela. I asked her to interview me, I suppose, about what's happening in Toronto, Ontario, Canada at the moment on the professional front relationship to me. The Ontario College of Psychologists, which is the board that regulates the practice of psychology in Ontario and hypothetically protects the, pro the public interest, has levied a series of what are, in essence, lawsuits against me for um, unprofessional conduct pertaining primarily to my social media communication. And so they have decided in their wisdom that I am to be required to undertake a series of re-education lessons uh, designed to ensure that I communicate in a manner they deem appropriate. And I have told them that there are no circumstances I can imagine under which I would be willing to do that. And the next step is to bring me before a public disciplinary hearing and then to suspend my clinical license. And so I'm making all of this public because I think people need to weigh in on whether I'm an alt-right Nazi harmful, uh, you know, bastion of, of intolerable political thought with a troll-like army of pathological followers, or whether the college itself is a corrupt nest of social justice vipers hell-bent on envy and revenge and using the tiny fraction of people who are complaining to put forward their own brand of personal pathology and vindictiveness. And, well, I'll make everything public except for that which I can't do on legal grounds and let everybody decide for themselves. That's the plan because I might be wrong, and uh, I guess if I am, I need to learn how. In any case, Michaela is going to talk to me for 90 minutes, and uh, we're going to walk through some of this, and maybe you'll find that interesting, and maybe you won't. Um, why would you care? Well, that's, I guess, what you'll figure out if you listen to the talk. One reason might be, it's my opinion that 
the regulatory boards that govern professional conduct in Canada, particularly in the US as well, and in the West more broadly, have become so corrupted by the woke ideology that the professionals you depend on in moments of crisis for legal advice and medical advice and psychological counseling, some of which can be life and reputation saving, they can no longer be trusted because they're being required by the professional bodies to lie to you in the service of this warped, um, radical leftist ideology that's now become, what would you call it, mandatory for right speakers wherever they might exist. And so that's why you might want to listen and decide for yourself whether you think that might be true. So anyways, onward with the discussion. And thanks, Michaela, for agreeing to do this. Hey guys, I'm coming on my dad's channel to interview him because he's dealing with some serious things right now, like usual, kind of like usual. So first off, how are you? How are you doing, dad? Well, not too bad. Um, I've been preparing my public response to the decision of the Ontario College of Psychologists to require me to do mandatory social media communication retraining. Um, they've, they have, the College of Psychologists is the regulatory board for the practice of psychology in Ontario. There are a variety of regulated professions, medicine, dentistry, teaching, architecture, psychology. That's not all of them. And these regulated professions have a board that's appointed by the government whose mandate is to protect the public from unprofessional behavior on the part of the members of the regulated professions. And people can submit complaints to those bodies if they believe that they've been treated um, unprofessionally or unethically or otherwise inappropriately by a college member, so a member of the relevant profession. And uh, the college has been after me nonstop with complaints since I rose to public prominence in 2016, although not once before that in the 20 years that I practiced as a clinical psychologist. So this isn't the university that's after me like it was in 2017, 2016. This is the College of Psychologists, which has started pursuing me in 2016 and has never let up. Now, what happens is that people, anyone anywhere can submit a complaint about me for anything I've done or said, hypothetical or otherwise, and then the college can, and that doesn't matter if they're a client of mine or ever have been, or if I've had any dealings with them, or even if they're the person who has hypothetically been harmed by my behavior. Mm. Um, and the college has decided to pursue a sequence of such complaints, even though it's in their power to dismiss them as vexatious or frivolous, which is what I asked for, on the grounds that my social media communication has caused harm to people. And so they've essentially taken out what are the equivalent of more than a dozen lawsuits against me. And I say they're equivalent to lawsuits because the penalty for being found guilty of such misbehavior is quite serious. It can involve re-education, public apology, or even the removal of my ability to practice or to describe myself as a clinical psychologist. And of course, it took me about 10 years, all things considered, to get licensed. It's a very difficult process, and I'm not inclined to give it up lightly. In any case, they have been after me to a tremendous degree in 2022. I think there's 13 or 14 complaints, each of which culminated in one of these lawsuits. I'm represented by legal counsel. There's so many of them that they're difficult to keep track of. Um, I probably went through 400 pages of documentation this week. And you asked me how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, First of all, I found it extremely difficult to keep my, my rage under control because a tremendous amount of my time is being wasted. It's extremely expensive. The allegations are not only utterly preposterous, but entirely political in nature. 
And then I was also afraid of it. You know, the first complaint came in 2017, 2016 in December, at the same time the university was after me, and at the same time the Canadian Revenue Authorities were after me for a mistake they admitted making six months later. And you remember that was an extremely stressful time. And I was accused at that point of inappropriate personal conduct in relationship to one of my clients. All of that was uh, dismissed, by the way, without hesitation, although the college did decide at that point because they needed to decide I was guilty of something, even though I wasn't guilty of what I was of what I was most seriously accused of. They decided I hadn't handled my email properly at that point when I was getting thousands of emails a day. Yeah. Um, and that that made it difficult for my clients to get a hold of me, even though I had given every single one of my clients my personal phone number and could contact me by text, which is something, by the way, that psychologists never do, you know, for, for obvious reasons. So in any case, it's been a continuous stream of investigations and legal defense. Since then, um, I found that kind of accusation of serious personal misconduct unbelievably stressful in 2016. It certainly mm -hmm. contributed to be, me becoming ill. Yeah. And then I didn't really want to revisit it, you know, and so I started going through all that documentation last week so that I could lay out everything that's been levied at me. And... Uh, you know, I went through all that stuff from 2017, even talking about it now, it makes me shake to some degree. Um, afterwards, I could hardly stand up. I like just about fainted three or four times and, you know, had a real hard time keeping myself composed. It's very off-putting to, let's say, to have attempted to conduct myself extremely carefully in my professional occupations as a professor and as a clinical psychologist for decades, you know, to, to step very carefully. I, of course, I never had any behavioral accusations levied against me at Harvard or the University of Toronto or as a clinical psychologist in the 30 years I was a professor and 20 years of private practice. And then to be accused of serious personal misconduct, the essential claim was my seductive behavior as a therapist and the evidence... Uh, offered was that when I was offering my advice, I would spin my wedding ring, which was apparently some Freudian indication that I was, you know, sexually interested in the particular complaining client. Now, I don't particularly blame her. I mean, had she not had her problems, she wouldn't have come and seen me, you know. But the college has a tremendous gavel to wield, a tremendous hammer, and to have that brought down on you is... It's no joke, you know, and I've known a lot of people now who've been investigated for that sort of thing um, by mobs, let's say, of one form or another, and it's very, very hard on them. So when I revisited all this, it was really, and I'd probably been avoiding doing it to some degree, you know, although, you know, we had to wait until we moved forward with our legal challenge before we could make any of this public. There was still an element of avoidance, and no wonder, you know, it really lit me on fire again when I was going through this stuff. But one of the upsides was, you know, I reviewed the and organized the complaints that are levied against me now, the accusations for which I've already been sentenced, essentially. And uh, the upside of it was that, well, these accusations are so incredibly preposterous and political that it's almost incomprehensible. You know, I'm literally being... Well, the, the requirement is, so the college has decided after pursuing these complaints that I don't know how to regulate my behavior properly in my social media communications. And so I need to be taught by their experts how to conduct myself appropriately. And so I have to undergo a series of courses, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching sessions with their <laughs> deemed experts, and they're going to tell me, how I should craft my words and what I should say and what I shouldn't say. And I am required to pay for that. It's about $250 an hour, which, you know, in our current circumstances isn't a concern in and of itself, but you can understand that for many oh, people yeah. that would be tremendously burdensome. Um, and the person who's teaching me is going to submit regular reports to the college and they're going to decide when I've learned how to be 
the sort of person I should be so that I don't bring disgrace upon the profession and harm people. <laughs> and so the claims of harm are absolutely unwarranted. Not a single person who submitted a complaint in this latest round is a client of mine, although half of them falsely claimed to be. Oh, so they're stable and the people. And pursued their complaints anyways. Yeah. Well, I think some of it is they're probably confused about the what they're required, how they're required to identify themselves in the complaint form to be fair. Okay, or they're just unstable people who spend their time complaining about celebrities on Twitter. Well, well, that's that's the other option. If that's you know, what you're but, doing with your life. You're probably not the most stable person. Yeah, and and so, anyways, I've gone through all these complaints and. So here's some of them. I retweeted Pierre Polyev, who's Canada's leader of the opposition, when he was making, when he was criticizing the mask, uh, the mask lockdowns. I just retweeted him, and I said, I, I said essentially that I agreed with him. That's a complaint. I they actually listed that that's as a complaint. That's one of the complaints. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. They listed the fact that I criticized Justin Trudeau. On, on multiple occasions. There's a complaint that at one point the police in Ottawa were threatening to act with children's aid to take the children away from the truckers mm -hmm. in Ottawa and apprehend them on the grounds that their parents who were involved in the protest were endangering them. And I tweeted and said, I'm not so sure that we should get the police involved in taking away the children of protesters, and we should think about this. And apparently that makes me an untrustworthy advocate for child, advocate for children who face childhood sexual abuse. Oh my god! You're a mandatory reporter as a psychologist, eh? And so if you, if, if it comes to your attention that someone has been abused, you're mandated to report it. Um, and so apparently I'm now untrustworthy in that regard because I didn't want the police to conspire with idiot social workers in Ottawa to apprehend the children of protesters. And so that's another example of my reprehensible behavior. Um, I'm being called out for the fact that I uh, objected to Ellen Page's uh, surgical mutilation at the hands of her physicians and her consequence consequent advertisement of her new torso on social media. And uh, I'm also required to submit to this media retraining education because I objected to the Sports Illustrated cover of that uh, relatively overweight young model. And there's other complaints, but, but, but th that's, that's the bulk of them. And so at least half, oh yes, I criticized, oh, I, I tweeted out to Jacinda Ardern that I was coming to New Zealand with my army of alt-right-wing <laughs> trolls, you know, which was clearly a joke, and that's also a complaint, because I guess that sort of joke isn't funny when you're dealing with, you know, woke progressives like Jacinda Ardern and Justin Trudeau. And so, um, oh yes, I counseled people to commit suicide, that's another one. So wait, wait, wait. Um, you should somebody you should describe. Oh yeah, describe that. Yeah, yeah. Well, somebody had tweeted out their idea that the planet had too many people on it, and this is not a statement I am very fond of because every time I hear someone say that, I think, okay, who exactly are these excess people that you're referring to, and who gets to decide that? And how do you know that when they decide that, something terrible won't happen, given that these are excess people? And isn't it okay if I question the humanitarian intent of your motives for making such a reprehensible comment? So I tweeted uh, to someone who made an argument like that. I tweeted and said, uh, feel free to leave at any time, and which is obviously an ironic joke, but some bloody social worker in the United States decided that that was a... Um, like an incitation to suicide and so complained Lovely. about that. And yeah, and so, and that's, I think, I think that's all the complaints. So let's review this. Not a single one of them was levied by a client of mine, present or former. Not a single one of them was levied by anyone I had actually said anything directly to, mm -hmm. private or public. There's no evidence whatsoever that, of, that I've produced anything 
regarding harm because no one has stepped forward to claim harm who is directly harmed. So it's third party indirect supposition of so-called harm to someone they don't know. And that's the level of evidence that the College of Psychologists is willing to accept as critical. You know, now, when they responded to me, they said that I've, you know, brought disgrace to the profession and caused undue harm to people. And I responded, I'll make this public too, with about 40 questions about their methods. So here's one. Said, well, before I submit myself to this media training re-education, because I'm bound by the ethical standards of my profession, I'm not willing to go get educated unless there's evidence that the contents of the educational program are directly related to the practice of my profession and that there's evidence that undertaking such re-education actually makes me a more competent therapist. Do you have any independent documentation that these experts that you have hired and foisted upon me have anything approximating genuine expertise? And do you have any evidence whatsoever that such training programs are effective? And of course, they said, uh, we don't have to answer questions like that. And I asked them, I said, you know, there's some evidence that I've done some good in the, in the world. Um, about 7 million people bought my first public book, and I have 15 million subscribers on the three main platforms we operate on on social media, and uh, lots of people seem to come to my lectures when I am out publicly speaking, saying that I've really helped them in their lives, and that's thousands or hundreds of thousands or possibly even millions of people, and so I think I can stack up a pretty good, plus all the students that I taught at Harvard and the University of Toronto and all my clinical clients, um, who by and large were pretty damn happy to be working with me and vice versa. It's like, how do you calculate the harm to benefit ratio? And uh, you know, what evidence do you have that I actually constitute a sufficient threat to the integrity of the profession that you're willing to bring the second harshest actions you have in your arsenal against me? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that was, we don't have to answer questions like that. And I had like 40 questions like that, none of which were answered. Their answer basically was, we can do whatever the hell we want. And we're telling you, you better go get re-educated or you face a disciplinary hearing. That's the next step, is that I'd have to face a disciplinary hearing. And what I'm going to do for that, I do believe they videotaped that. And I'll take the videotape and put it on my YouTube channel and people can decide for themselves, which is exactly what I want to have happen in this situation. Like you and I talked about our strategy here. Our, you know, and I have been unbelievably angry about yeah. this. So it's been very hard for me to control my anger, you know, and I know that's not right and that my desire to seek vengeance is inappropriate as is the desire in general to seek vengeance, right? But it's, uh, it's very difficult to read through these allegations and to face this waste of my time and the stress it puts on us to me and your mother and, well, and our whole family without being outraged at this, you know? And a lot of the battle for the last couple of weeks has just been to keep my temper under control. But you and I, we talked through this and I talked through it with your mom and with Julian, you know, about the fact that our attitude in general has been just to tell everybody what's going on as clearly as we possibly can. And I want to make it all public I'm preparing a document today redacting all the names of the complainants, which I have been provided with by the college, by the way. I'm going to redact all their names and that, identifying information. That's also ridiculous. Just This just isn't set up very well. Like, you'd think that if you were a problematic psychologist, you shouldn't be provided with the people's names that complained about you. That doesn't seem well, smart. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know what to make of that. And it's also problematic that people can levy accusations that bring down the heavy hand of a bureaucratic organization and bear absolutely no personal yep. responsibility to that. Like, but in a sane society, so that would have been Canada up until about five or six years ago, people didn't weaponize the colleges, generally speaking. You know, professionals weren't afraid of their regulatory bodies because generally the only people who complained were either people who were clearly disturbed, you know, in some fundamental sense, or people who had a legitimate reason to believe that they had suffered harm 
as a consequence of unprofessional behavior on the part of a lawyer or teacher mm -hmm. or physician or psychologist. But the, the uh, radical leftist types have figured out how to weaponize these, these investigative boards, and the boards themselves have become staffed pretty much uniformly with social justice-oriented, politically correct, full compassionate, narcissistic commissars, and they do everything they can to make life miserable for anyone who doesn't share their political opinions. I mean, it's actually, it's actually almost beyond comprehension to me that I'm engaged in a battle in my country of Canada where I have to defend my right to practice my profession as a licensed psychologist, and I would say especially with my educational pedigree. I mean, Jesus, I was a professor at Harvard and the University of Toronto. I trained clinical psychologists, you know, and the fact that I have to defend my right to conduct my own profession because I retweeted a tweet from the official leader of Canada's conservative opposition party yeah. and criticized Justin Trudeau and have made, at least upon occasion, conservative political pronouncements. The fact that that is now, that has now made me subject to heavy-handed punishment and investigation by a government-sponsored regulatory board is, I just, it's absolutely incomprehensible. And so that's also, I would say, difficult emotionally because I just can't believe it's happening. Like, what the hell? This is insane. And so, I mean, and it's, you know, the other thing I think too, it's so strategically foolish on the part of the college. I mean, it's one thing to go after me for, let's say, saying something not so pleasant about Ellen Page or about uh, the swimsuit illustrated model. At least you could have an argument about whether or not I was using undue force in my argumentation on those grounds, you know. But to pillory me for engaging in what are clearly political conversations is, well, I, I don't even know what to say about it. I can't, I can't believe it's happening. It's beyond comprehension to me. And so, you know, and that makes me think, well, you know, is it just me? You know, because people tweet out at me, well, Peterson, you always seem to be in trouble with one authority or another. Maybe it's just you. It's like, where there's smoke, there's fire, you know? And uh, I can understand why people think that way. And if something happens to you repeatedly, you have to start wondering if it's you or the situation. But the way that I'm dealing with this, the way that we've dealt with this as a family right from the beginning is just to make it all public, mm -hmm. right? And to, and to allow light to be shone on the situation and to derive our conclusions mostly as a consequence of watching the broad public response. And I'm trying to do exactly the same thing here. Like, you know, I'm a very guilt-prone person, and when some come, come, someone comes after me with accusations, I'm very likely to assume that there is a core of truth in them. And, uh, but I also believe that I have the right to defend myself. And one of the ways of doing that in this situation, this is why we're having this conversation, is like, I don't believe, I don't have faith that I can expect fair treatment at the hands of this board. And I also don't have any faith partly because I've talked to a bunch of my legal friends. I don't have a lot of faith in the Canadian judiciary. I mean, people have told me, law professors have told me now that they see continually Canadian courts who are extremely activist in nature, dispensing completely with such niceties as common law precedent when they're rendering their judgments. And so Yikes. I certainly don't believe that the College of Psychologists will treat me fairly. I have seen them treat very few people fairly. And... I don't believe that even if we push this forward on the judicial front, which is our plan at the moment, like implementing a challenge to their ruling, for example, on, on Canadian constitutional grounds, because at least in principle, we have the right to free speech and freedom of conscience in this country, in although I don't really think we do. Yeah. yeah, in principle. Yeah, it's, the protection has turned out with the Canadian Charter of Rights is an unbelievably weak and poorly written document that provides Canadians with almost no protection for their rights whatsoever. It was definitely a giant step backwards in relationship to the English common law tradition. And um, we're now subject to an extraordinarily badly written document whose fundamental 
propositions can be superseded by the government anytime they think there's a sufficiently dire state of affairs. So, hmm. so I'm making it public and people can decide for themselves. Uh, I'll release every bit of correspondence between the college and, and me over the next few days, you know, redacting out the identifiers. And, I, you know, I've been... On your website? I've been ambivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been ambivalent about that too because part of me thinks, well, these people who are complaining t- to me, they shouldn't get to do it anonymously and hidden away from any consequences of their accusations. But I believe that I'm legally and hypothetically, ethically required to maintain privacy even in the face mm-hmm. of these, what are essentially legal attacks. And, you know, I, like I said, I'm ambivalent about that because I don't see why I should be made public in such a manner without my acu- accusers having to bear the weight of some responsibility for weaponizing this bureaucracy and against me. Now, whatever, it doesn't matter well, it's because, because I'm not going to do it's, it. It's but. because you've been harming people on Twitter and they're saving people from your harm. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's the rationale, exactly. Well, you know, and it's also been difficult to formulate a defense because I'm not even sure, and, I, and this is, I think, um, part and parcel either of the ignorance of the college or their incompetence. I can't even tell what I'm being accused of So, for example, one of the complaints submitted as evidence the entire transcript of my three-hour discussion with Joe Rogan. And so, you know, and I said all sorts of horrible things on that. Yeah, I know. It's everything this man ever said. (laughs) That entire podcast was harmful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you defend yourself against that? You know, I mean, I think they were objecting primarily to my comments about climate change models and the apocalyptic conclusions that have been derived from them. And you know, and complaining that I'm not a scientist, and bloody well I am a scientist, by the way. I have 100 scientific publications, and that's a lot, and I can read a scientific paper and understand it, unlike those who are accusing me or the people who sit on the college, by the way. (laughs) And so I'm perfectly capable of understanding a scientific paper, and I believe, and many scientists who are very solid scientists, like Richard Franzen of MIT, who has a pedigree that's absolutely impeccable, agree with everything I said. And so, now that doesn't mean it's right. That's not my claim. But my claim is, is that I'm not going off, you know, with a half-loaded gun here, and I don't say things lightly. But anyways, it's not easy to figure out exactly what I'm being accused of. And so, you know, so the upshot is essentially that I either submit myself to this media retraining program with their experts... Yeah, well, that's not yeah. happening. There's just not a chance that that will ever happen. I can't imagine a circumstance under which I would be willing to do that. I mean, I can't imagine how I would possibly sit through such a thing. That sounds awful. You know, somebody awful. said I should just record it and put it on. No way. On, online. You wouldn't be able yeah, to well, stand I, I yourself. Could... You'd, you'd well, last like I just 30 can't... seconds in there. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know if I'd like to put any educator through the horrible process of having to come and try to re-educate me either because I can't see how that would go particularly well for them. Yeah. So I'm not sure who would end up re-educated in a situation like that. But I have my doubts that it would be me because people have been trying to re-educate me for a long time and it really hasn't worked that well. So, and that's generally because I, I don't say things that I haven't investigated right to the bottom. So, in any case, it's very stressful, this. And I've spent, you know, hundreds of hours just trying to organize the arguments that have been marshaled against me and understand what the hell they are. You know, part of the process that's punitive, and the bloody activists know this, is that as soon as you have complaints levied against you, you're basically snowed under by the obligations of what's essentially a serious lawsuit. And, you know, you might say, well, it's not a lawsuit, it's just an investigation. It's like, well, the college itself suggests that once one of these investigations is levied, that the person being investigated uh, acquire legal Mm -hmm. counsel. So they know bloody well right that this is essentially a criminal, a quasi-criminal investigation, or at least it has that element of process about it. And the social justice warriors who are utilizing these colleges have figured that out, and they're perfectly willing to use third-party bureaucracies as cudgels to enforce their oh-so-compassionate, narcissistic worldview. 
and to be censorious. You know, and you see this on Twitter too, as I've made this public, there are good thinkers everywhere who are saying, you know, I got what I deserved, even though it isn't obvious exactly why I deserved it. And they're perfectly happy to see this happening. And, you know, that shows you what kind of motivations a large percentage of the population has. You know, in Eastern Germany, a third of the population were KGB informers. And so there's a very large swath of the, public, of the public who would be perfectly happy to see anybody who doesn't share their political views punished harshly for their audacity. And I think that's particularly true of radical leftists in relationship to anything that's centrist or conservative. And it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Like every, you know, I don't only say conservative things, although in the current political climate, I suppose I am more conservative. Um, but every single complaint that's been levied against me is because I uttered a conservative perspective. And so, you know, the probability that that's merely a consequence of chance is vanishingly small. It's one half times one half, 12 times, and that's a pretty damn tiny number. So the idea that this isn't politically motivated is preposterous, yeah. conceptually and statistically. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel like we've had a lot of people reach out to specifically from Canada that are working professionals like doctors. I've spoken with a lot of them who've had generally former patients decide that they didn't like what they were saying on Twitter specifically. Yeah. So conservative doctors, and they're like, oh, I don't like what you're saying on Twitter, and then sending complaints to colleges to get their licenses. So I don't think this is just happening to you. I think we've talked to a lot of people oh, it's in Canada not. that it's happening to, which means what, like, what profession does that mean you can't exactly trust to tell you the truth anymore? Well, you certainly can't trust physicians or psychologists because they're mandated with regard to, um, to uh, affirmative care now. So, for example, if you, you can't assume that if you take a child of yours who's gender dysphoric in for professional evaluation that they're going to get any evaluation at all because psychologists and physicians are mandated to do nothing but agree with the gender dysphoric individual. And so, and, and lawyers are in the same situation as well is that they're not, if, for example, a while back, the, the governing body of the legal profession in Ontario mandated diversity, equity, and uh, inclusivity requirements in relationship to hiring, even on small law firms in, in Ontario, with the clear implication that if you didn't buy the DEI, social justice warrior political line, that you were, that your law firm was no longer in concordance with the dictates of the professional governing body. Now, Bruce Party, a law professor at Queen's, fought that back forthrightly with some success. But I've had discussions with all sorts of teachers and nurses and lawyers and physicians. All these people, Canadians need to know this, all these people are so terrified of, a good proportion of these people are so terrified of the regulatory bodies that there isn't a hope in hell that they're going to be able to tell you the truth when you're in the middle of a medical, educational, or legal crisis. And so, you know, and Canadians are in a real bind because, you know, for 175 years, it was okay in Canada to basically put trust in the public institutions, educational institutions and professional colleges and even the political parties. You knew what they stood for and generally they played the game straight. And that's flipped completely upside down in the last seven years. And that's a terrible, bitter pill for Canadians to swallow. And most of them don't even know it's happened because their primary sources of news, like CBC, mm. is completely corrupted by its $1.4 billion a year payoff from the federal government. CTV isn't much better. Most ordinary people have no idea where to get news. And so they're faced with this terrible conundrum, which is, well, either things have gone badly sideways, especially toward the left in Canada, or the people complaining, like me, let's say, or the truckers, for that matter, are misogynist, racist, alt-right-wing, Confederate, Nazi bigots. And it's a hell of a lot easier to buy the latter than the former, and no wonder. But the unfortunate truth is, well, people can decide that for themselves. We'll walk through this again. I retweeted Pierre Polyev. He's the leader of the opposition in Canada. And because of that, I'm being investigated by my regulatory body 
my public reputation is at stake and I may no longer be able to practice or, or describe myself as a clinical psychologist. And that's how it is. And it isn't just Polyev. It's also the fact that I criticized Trudeau and I criticized an Ottawa city councillor and I made a joke at Jacinda Ardern. And it's not just fluke that every single one of them is on the left. And that's how we are in Canada. And it's not like I don't have some sympathy for the left. You know, I like Russell Brand. Brand does what he can to stand up for working class types against corporate overreach and corporate government collusion to produce a kind of fascist, oppressive fascist overreach in relationship to the working class. And I understand perfectly well that there's a need for a left-wing political voice to stand for the working class, and especially perhaps against the depredations of monopolistic capitalists. But that isn't what's happening on the left in relationship to the sorts of things we're talking about in the least. So, well, so, and it's going to be, it's going to be very hard for Canadians to wake up to this reality. I see no evidence whatsoever that they've woken up yet. Oh, not at all. Not at all, no. So, well, so we'll see what happens when we make all of this public. The next step for the college is to haul me in front of a disciplinary board and, you know, rake me over the coals personally. And I don't uh, imagine all except their diktats when that happens. I can't imagine any circumstances under which that would occur. And then their next step is to publicly announce my refractory nature. They've already defined me as a repeat offender, by the way, highly likely to re-offend. Well, you are highly likely. That's their likely, terminology. High, high, that seems like accurate terminology to me. Yeah, well, yeah, I know. Well, if the offenses are defined as saying what I think yeah. publicly, then it's pretty much certain I'm going to re-offend. But it's a hell of a terminology to be, to be pasted with, you know, repeat offender with a high likelihood of re-offending, you know. So and, do we have a timeline about how long this is going to take? And do you, what do you think the percentage, what do you think the likelihood is that they'll take your license? Well, I... I don't see what choice they have because the next thing, look, what I would like from them, because I might as well make it clear, I want every single one of them to resign and to apologize to me. Well, that's not going to happen. They can't resign. That seems highly unlikely. That yeah, seems very unlikely, and I don't know if they're going to. Well, what they if, could resign. What if they just no, stopped? Really what if they just said, you know what, out of 15 million people, 12 complaints isn't that bad given they're about tweets and we've decided to stop investigating you. What if they just said that? Well, I don't see how, well, I don't see how they can do that without admitting that the whole bloody thing was a scam to begin with. Because if it was just one complaint, they could say, well, you know, we've reconsidered and, uh, you know, we may have acted too hastily. But when you do it 13 times, you know, three times is a pattern. 13 times, that's pretty much a decision. And if you have to announce publicly that you were wrong 13 times, you're probably so wrong that you're not fit for the job. Mm -hmm. so, so the alternative is, I'm going to make this public. I've already told them essentially to go to hell, although I did it politely. And uh, now they have to drag me in front of a disciplinary hearing, which I will make unbelievably public. And so, and then because I won't move in that regard, as far as I can tell, I don't see that they have a leg to stand on. You know, not only am I being accused in the vast majority of the accusations of having unacceptable political beliefs, but half the people who complained claimed they were clients of mine. So procedurally, this is also a nightmare for them, as far as I can tell, because at minimum, they should have inquired in relationship <clears throat> to these claims that the complainants were clients of mine. They should have noted yeah. to them that they weren't, and they should have required them to re-initiate uh, the complaint process without falsehood. And they didn't do any of that repeatedly. And, you know, that's particularly germane because if the complaint is levied by someone who was a client, the college is obligated and also tends to take those complaints much more seriously and to facilitate their movement forward. Mm -hmm. So I think they've, 
they're so, they've demonstrated such a brutal level of incompetence and corruption that I can't see that they have any way forward except to continue to pursue me or to resign en masse. And they're not going to do the latter. And so I, you know, and this is a dreadful, you know, I've met people, Douglas Murray is a good example. I've met people in my voyage through this weird political landscape who really like this sort of fight, you know, who are up for it. And this is not a criticism of such people. It's, we need people like that, you know, who are capable and willing to have a scrap. Now, the danger of that is that you have more scraps than you should, you know, and that you might be inclined to take pleasure in it when you shouldn't. But I'm not that sort of person. I hate this. Mm -hmm. It just, it's really, I find it really, really difficult. I like peace. I mean, part of the reason I engage in conflict is because I, it's paradoxical in some sense, I really want peace. And so if I have a problem with someone, I want to address it right now, mm. 100% right to the bottom to get it the hell out of the way so we don't fight about it for the next 10 years. You know, and your mother and I have conducted our whole relationship with that. Yep. You know, it's so funny. We had a date the other night upstairs, you know, and she comes upstairs and this has happened probably the last three dates we shared. And she always has three bitchy things yeah. to say to me before the date starts. And there, what she does though, is she tells me some of the things that are on her mind that are maybe interfering a bit with our relationship. And they're minor things. Like I think the last thing is we, we were discussing how to clean the sink. So we were both happy about yeah. it. She wasn't exactly happy with how I was cleaning the sink. And, you know, and then it was out of the way. And then, it was completely out of the way, you know, and then we had a very peaceful time together because there wasn't anything boiling away on the back burner. And when you and Julian were home, you know, we conducted our family life the same way. If we had a bloody problem, we were going to have a discussion about it right now yep. and get to the bottom of it and fix it so that we didn't hate each other. And so I don't like, and I never liked those conversations. I find them very stressful. I'm too high in negative emotion and too high in agreeableness to enjoy that sort of thing. That's my, you know, the detrimental consequences of my feminine temperament to the degree that I have that. And it's quite the degree, actually. Yeah. Um, and of course, suppose that's partly what tilted me towards being a clinician yeah. in the first place, right? So, and you know, it's, it has its advantages because I do feel the pain of other people quite deeply, but that also makes it, very hard for me to fight, even though I'll fight when I know the consequences of not fighting is more fighting. <laughs> so yeah, well, that's a paradox, you know, but it isn't because I enjoy it. And, yeah. you know, I, I tried to let the college know through backdoor channels that it might be reasonable for them to consider not doing this because the consequences of making it public would not be positive for the, in my estimation, for the people involved. And I don't want to bring public pressure to bear on people without necessity because it's very unpleasant to be at the center of that kind of focal attention. Well, and you shouldn't, you know, unless you're narcissistic. You shouldn't bully people, hide behind this pseudo-government organization and pressure people. I think if they get negative feedback, then they have more than that coming to them. Canada is yeah, says like, the disagree well, no, says the disagreeable. But what person. even being in Canada is unpleasant now. I feel like the political landscape has ruined the country, and it's because of people who hide behind well or just hide in anonymity and pressure other people for being harmful. Yeah, using bureaucracy. Yeah. So yeah. whatever. They shouldn't be bullying. Yeah, people. well. Well, and they're not just bullying why... you. Like, obviously, they're, we've had other doctors reach out to say that they're being pressured, their license is being pressured because of their conservative opinions on Twitter. That's not what these yeah, regulatory well, I, I courts talk, are for. I talked to one of my great friends this week, a physician as well as a lawyer, and I suggested that maybe the three of us write an article for the National Post about the state of um, regulatory bodies in Ontario and in Canada more generally, in the West more generally. And because uh, I thought maybe a one, two, three punch might be more effective, you know. But my, my friend said that, and he's a very brave man and also very, very careful in what he says and does. 
He said his financial house wasn't in sufficient order to initiate that battle yet. He wants to do it, you know, but he still has... Th but the point is that even though he's a very brave man and he's made a lot of public statements already, he's intimidated enough by the College of Physicians so that even though he knows that this would be politically effective, he feels that he's not well defended enough yet to take this on fully. And, you know, I can understand that. One of the things that made me able to do this from the beginning when the university came after me was that I had three independent streams of income, right? You know, as a professor, I had a clinical practice and I had a pretty successful business. And so I could lose two of those, any two of those without, you know, being destitute and putting my family at risk. And I'm still in that position now, which is also partly why I'm willing to do this publicly, you know, because I don't want this precisely to be about me because that's just annoying. I want to shed light on the fact that this is a, on my belief that this is a universal problem of public concern in Canada and elsewhere. And I can do that because the worst thing the college can do to me is, well, the worst thing they can do is suspend my license and make a public statement that because of my refusal to comply with their dictates, I'm no longer um, acceptable as a licensed clinical psychologist. And I don't want them to do that because I don't. I believe that I earned my license and am also a good advocate on the clinical front. I don't want to be in a position where faceless bureaucrats motivated by a political agenda and whatever envy and resentment they carry in their dark and nasty little hearts have the opportunity to strip me of something that I spent a decade of extremely hard work earning. And, but, you know, if, I, if they do strip it from me, well, first of all, that's not going to redound to their credit. Second, I can probably get licensed in a jurisdiction like Florida oh, with a bit that, of work if be, I wanted that'd to. That'd be satisfying. Yeah, Who well, wants I'd, to be part of I'd, this like, creepy little club of psychologists that are just telling people lies anyway? If the entire profession well, the, is being forced to not tell their clients the truth, then maybe you should it's worse drop than that, that club. It's worse than that. It's worse than that, Michaela. The... Uh, the, the bodies that govern the training programs for clinical psychologists in Canada, the Canadian Psychological Association, has increasingly moved to make it mandatory for universities that offer clinical psychology training to do that under the rubric of social justice or face the suspension of the accreditation of their programs. And that's also happening in medicine. You, everyone listening, you, should, you bloody well better listen to this, people, because we're entering a situation where the universities themselves are required to ensure that your physicians and your psychologists are of a particular political stripe, which essentially means radically left, not just left, but radically left, like social justice, full, woke, critical racist theory, oppressive, patriarchal, narrative, feminist, left wing, or <laughs> the institution itself will not be allowed to train physicians or psychologists. And I know that sounds like a conspiracy theory, and, well, go look it up for yourself and see if it's true, because it's true right down to the last word. And so if you Canadians, you think you're going to be served well by craven political ideologues, who are primarily selected to be physicians on the basis of their political purity, you've got a bloody another thing coming. That didn't work out so well in Eastern Europe. Let me tell you, it's not going to work out very well for us either. And so part of the reason I'm willing to make this battle public is to try to alert people to the fact that we're a hell of a lot farther down this road than we think. You know, I went through Eastern Europe for four months this spring talking to people there. Um, I had the privilege of meeting you know, 30 or 40 people in each country who were political or cultural leaders um, across the political spectrum, including leftists who'd been mobbed like mad by their own compatriots. And every single one of the people I talked to, virtually without exception in Eastern Europe, said something like, do you know what happened here between the end of the Second World War in 1989 when we were dominated by the communists? Do you know how awful it was here? That was particularly true in Albania. Do you know you people in the West are walking down exactly the same road? What the hell's wrong with you? Don't you notice? And this included Yikes. the socialists in those Eastern European countries. 
you know, who remember the tender mercies of the radical leftists and the fact that, you know, one out of three people in most of those countries, even if they were within your own family, were government informers. And where the joke was, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us, and where people spent hours in bread lines and fought over terrible little rat hole apartments as they were quasi starving to death, unable to ever tell the truth or speak. Yeah, that's not good. No, <laughs> no, and that's why you're in Florida. I know. Florida is great. It's weird. People here are weird, but it's, it's good weird. It's free weird. Yeah. It's not stifled yeah, like well, so, Toronto right now. I hate it Yeah, there. yeah. Like, I don't know how you felt going back there. And I don't know how, I've got lots of friends in Toronto, but it is not the same Toronto as it was in 2015 or 2016. You go there, it's kind of well, like mom- California. You can feel the weight of silence in that place. Yeah, well, your mom and I have been back here for a month. You know, we're pretty worried about coming back because we've faced a fair bit of resistance in our neighborhood. Like, I'm probably more unpopular in some sense in Toronto and more particularly in my neighborhood than I am anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And so it was somewhat worrisome to come back to Toronto. It's very you know, worrisome. My son moved out of our neighborhood in part because it was uncomfortable for him to be there, even though that's where he grew up, um, thanks to the machinations of certain neighbors it's been hard on your mom too, eh? Because I come downstairs, well, the other day when I was going through what happened in 2016, you know, I came downstairs, I could hardly stand up. A lot of the symptoms I had over the last couple of years came back. And that's really pretty frightening for me and for her to see. You know, I had to sit down on the floor five or six times. This sounds like This sounds like PTSD. Well, who knows, you know? what it is, but well, it I recovered fairly quickly, still. which is, you know, an indication of my return to health. So, but it's hard on your mom, too, because I'm bitchy as can possibly be after going upstairs and wrestling with this material. And, you know, we had a big conversation this week about how she should be involved, because I don't want to drag her into this. And, you know, and she doesn't want to blame me for being entangled in it. And we don't want to stress our relationship. You know, so I don't know how much to protect her from this and how much to share with her. You know, I thought, well, maybe when I'm writing out my college defense, I should go to a hotel room and, you know, grapple with it there because I'm much more irritable, at least for some period of time, after confronting all of this. Like, it's calmed down a bit now that I've got my argument, you know, in order. I've looked through all the material. There isn't any snakes left under the carpet to bite me. And so I think I'm through the most demanding part of it, although God only knows what's going to happen as this unfolds, because there's always the possibility I'll make a mistake while I'm defending myself too, you know, because I could easily do that because it's so complicated. But, um, But, you know, your mom and I are on the same page in relationship to this, which is, you know, she believes that if I just say what's happening, if I do my best to tell the truth without adornment and to try to keep my volatile temper under control that this will turn out the way things have turned out for us in the past, which is it'll be rather dreadful in the short term, but resolve itself somewhat favorably in the medium to long run. But that's easy to say when the medium to long run hasn't made itself manifest yet. Yeah. This also might just be this might just be something that's that's happening that no one can really get out of. And, and by that, I mean, um, we we see what direction the universities are going in. So you can fight back against that. But basically, at the moment, going to get a university degree seems like maybe not the best idea if you end up in hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, being taught by ideologues, and then being taught information that won't lead to a job just seems like a scam, right? And if this is what's going on with colleges and if they're controlling working professionals so that the working professionals have to work in a way that isn't truthful, I mean, how do you even fight, how do you fight back against that? At what point do you just stop playing in that game? Well, that, you know, people have asked me that too. Why don't you just give up your license? And I would say, well, because I wouldn't be giving it up 
I would be allowing it to be taken away from me. Like if I decide in a year that I don't want to be a licensed clinical psychologist because the whole damn profession has become corrupt, that's a whole different issue than letting this pack of craven commissar cowards organize behind the, ski, the scenes, utilize the complaints of random people online to justify their own envy and desire to prosecute and then fold in the yeah. face of that opposition. It's like, I'm not going to do that. Now, now you say, well, what do you do? And I think the only answer to that is, I think in, the only thing you have in a complex situation is the truth. That's all you have. That's why you have to abide by the truth, you know, because when things get complex around you, how do I deal with this politically? How do I deal with this personally? What do I say in this terribly complex situation? All you have there that's solid ground is the truth. And, and one of the things to reflect upon in relationship to that is that's also why you have to live honestly, you know, because it's very hard to tell the truth if you're simultaneously worried that the evidence of your past misbehavior, your past deceitful misbehavior is going to come to light. And so the reason you abide by the truth is so that you can say what you have to say about what you've done and who you are, and you can do that under impossibly difficult circumstances, and possibly that will sustain you through that, in, you know, in circumstances where if that's not possible, you're just going to get crushed. You know, and people might say, well, being investigated by your professional body isn't exactly a life-threatening event and you're just whining. It's like, look, for all you people who think that this is such a walk in the park, I'll tell you two things. Number one, I've known about 200 people who face this sort of thing now and every single one of them, every single one of them, with the exception of those people who like a fight, right, a tiny, tiny minority of people, maybe one or two in that entire 200, they reacted as if they or someone they loved had contracted a life-threatening illness. I've known people, very stable people, extremely elegant, polished, educated, well-positioned, well-supported people who literally ended up in psych wards because of the pressure that was brought to bear on them by the accusatory mob. And so those of you who think this is a cakewalk, you just bloody well wait till your neighbors show up on your doorstep with pitchforks and torches, and you just see what that's like for yourself. So you better watch yourself very carefully if you think that the people who are complaining about being mobbed are just complaining because they can't take it. Yeah. So. Well, that you also hear, you yeah. hear about, I mean, that that's a silly thing to think too. Um, you hear about university students who, you can get bullied online. It's not life-threatening, but it is life-threatening to some people. Like it makes some people suicidal from stress. Well, look, there's two, great, there's two great classes of fear, Michaela. There's only two. One of them is death, death and physiological and psychological disintegration. So you could think about that as the terror of biological vulnerability. That's one class of fears. The second great class of fear is fear of social exclusion. And part of the reason mm -hmm. is, is that historically, if you're socially excluded, you're dead. So they're the same yeah. fear, you know, because your social inclusion protects you from dying, right? You work with other people, you cooperate with them, you play with them, you, you eat with them, you're dependent on their labor. You, you're literally sustained in your life by your social desirability and your inclusion. And so if that's taken away from you, your reputation is sullied or shattered, people shun you, not only are you lonesome and isolated, but you're really in trouble. And your nervous system reacts to that as if it's a mortal threat, which it is. And so, you know, one of the problems with online culture and the culture of anonymity, you know, people have been pointing to this and saying, well, now are you sorry that you've gone after anonymous trolls because look at what happens if you're not anonymous is I think, no, I still think you people are cowardly and most of you are narcissists and you don't have the courage of your convictions. And... Mm -hmm. The problem of anonym anonymity is that the anonymous denouncers get the upper hand. And the research is clear on this. I just talked to Del Paulus this week, the, the developer of the idea of the dark triad and the dark oh, cool. tetrad. And there's a huge body of research that's emerging showing that 
online trolls, especially the anonymous types, are much more likely to be, this is fun, narcissistic. So that means they want social status. They believe they deserve social status and that they should get it without earning it. Machiavellian, which means they'll manipulate other people instrumentally to get what they want, independent of the consequences for that person. Wow. Psychopathic, which means they're predatory and parasitical. Parasitical meaning they're perfectly willing to use your work as means for their sustenance. And this is the new part of the dark tetrad, which has expanded it beyond the triad, sadistic. Lovely. Which means taking a positive, positive delight in the evident suffering of others. Not only failure to experience that suffering, so that callousness that might be part and parcel of, you know, being disagreeable and, and tough, but actually experiencing a positive delight in the suffering of others. That's what lulls means, right? L-O-L-Z, the plural of lulls, of, of L -O, sorry, lulls, L-U-L-Z, is the plural of L-O-L, laugh out loud. And to do something for the lulls is literally to do it online so that you can watch other people squirm and suffer. And that's sadism. And so Paulus has been, dis, you know, has been investigating ordinary dark tetrad behavior and looking at its contribution to online behavior. And it's certainly the case that, you know, some of the complaints that are levied against me by the Ontario College of Psychologists were just submitted to the college as tweets. So they just used the college tagline at CP Ontario to point oh my the college to one of my tweets, and that was the complaint. And so these people who are willing to use their anonymity to inform and accuse have the upper hand in a virtualized society. You know, and that's another reason why I've, you know, I've had some moral doubts about whether I should just make all of this public, like every bit of the documentation, everything the college sent me, which would include the identifiers of the complainants. But, and I'm still not sure that in the fundamental, most fundamental manner, that's not the appropriate thing to do. But because I'm not sure, and because at least technically my understanding at the moment is that that's not, that I wouldn't be abiding by the dictates of the college, I'm still more than willing to play by the rules. And those rules might be right, you know, I'm, I still, I don't know what to do with that because under normal circumstances, I can understand why the anonymity of the complainant publicly would be maintained, right? Because it stops people who have a legitimate grievance from being intimidated by those against whom they have the grievance. But those rules only apply when people aren't weaponizing the colleges. And as soon as the colleges are weaponized, when, when you can manipulate yeah. the bureaucracy into being a club for your viewpoint, then what constitutes ethical behavior on the part of a defendant starts to become murky. And that's also part of what makes this stressful. Yeah, well, I think it just ignoring the people who actually did the complaints is the right way to go because they don't matter. And if they weren't there, somebody else would be making the same kind of complaint. It's a college issue. Right, but that's a weird argument, right? Because, and I, you may well be right, and that's obviously what we've decided to do too. But there is part of me that also thinks, no, you know, any given individual can cause a lot of trouble if yeah. they set out to do that. And the idea that you shouldn't be responsible for your accusations is questionable, especially when what you're essentially doing is levying the equivalent of a legal charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the right option. It also, I think, just on a more selfish level, I think it'll be easier, given the fact that this is going to be a battle for a while, and it might end it might end badly. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't trust Canada. It would be better for you emotionally not to be involved in a personal way as much as you can. So, like, forget who the people who made the complaints are, even though they're probably despicable human beings. <laughs> There's tons of despicable human beings out there. Better to just ignore them and tell everybody what's going on and ideally have a backup plan. Like, if they do come for your license, can you just... I mean, I assume getting a license... Yeah, is well, a, it's, it's is a, hard to know. You know, it's hard to know if it's better to ignore them. There's lots of psychological studies about what people do to cheaters in games. And people are so mo motivated to punish cheaters that they'll give up some of their own privileges for the right to do so. <laughs> and some of that's actually salutary. Well, look, Michaela, if you let the cheaters get away with it, 
They dominate and take everything. That's the psychopathic niche. That's why it even exists biologically, is because you can get somewhere with exploitation. And you particularly get somewhere with exploitation if the people you are exploiting don't object. And so you actually have a moral obligation to object, you know, to not let people get away with breaking the rules. When people come after me, well, I don't, they can't just be let off the hook, right? So it, it's very, but I, look, I think we've worked, walked this through quite appropriately, is that no, I should really be concentrating on the college and not the individual complainants. I should be concentrating on the college in a way that has broad public significance yeah. because it shouldn't just be about me. It's about a broader social problem that we should use the truth and public exposure, transparency, to mount the best defense. And we should all keep our heads while doing so. But that's a, well, there's no better strategy than that. But it's a tight rope to walk. That's for sure. And the, the other problem is, Mick, it's so easy to slip off this. You know, it's like when I've been in the most tendentious interviews that have been directed at me, um, Helen Lewis comes to mind mm -hmm. in particular, every single comment that some of these journalists have made is a trap, right? And the trap is, I think I could goad you into saying something that would be impulsive and aggressive enough to blacken your reputation permanently so, and therefore to destroy your life in some fundamental sense, just so that it would redound to my moral credit. And if you all listening think that I'm being paranoid, you go read Nellie Bowles' apology for what she did as a New York Times journalist, yeah. and you tell me that this isn't true, because she came right out and said that's exactly what she did when she worked at the New York Times. Now, she thinks she's learned better, but I would say if you already went that far, in that direction, you have an awful lot of learning to do. Yeah. And I would be very hesitant to claim you've now learned your lesson and are a good person. You know, there's some things that it takes a long time to come back from, and that's certainly one of them. I would happily destroy someone's reputation just so that my articles got more attention online. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, really? And you knew that too. You didn't just do it unconsciously. You did it consciously, and you did it repeatedly and you did it for the New York Times, and now you're sorry. It's like, yeah, 10 years in a convent flagellating yourself might make you sorry, maybe. Like I've watched people in my clinical practice try to walk back from significant moral errors. It is not that easy. You know, there's that Catholic doctrine that you can be saved and redeemed no matter what your sin. It's like, that's true, but that doesn't mean you, have, you don't have to face the consequences of what you've done. And like, if you want to repent and you've done something seriously wrong, so much of you have to change, has to change, that it's almost like you have to die in order to be reborn. So anyways, for those who are listening, that's another reason why you should try to step forward carefully in your life, you know, because you will be called to attend for your misbehavior, and it will occur during a period of crisis. And if you're a mess and a deceitful mess, you're gonna find yourself in trouble so profound, you can barely imagine it. So, anyways, I don't know, kid. This isn't really what I wanted to do on your birthday. This is exactly what I wanted to do on my birthday. <laughs> I think that yeah. I think that's good. I think I think we covered what's going on and we'll keep people updated. We can do another update podcast. And you're going to record anything that happens in the future. I think that's more than fair. Record everything as much as possible and just release yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'm not doing any of this behind closed doors. So, enough of that. If it has to be done behind closed doors, you know, unless I'm convinced that there's a real concern for confidentiality. If it has to be done behind closed doors, the reason for that is either, you know, justifiable concerns for privacy or a kind of corruption that can't bear public scrutiny. And since this is a public uh, inquiry as to my suitability to speak publicly as a clinical psychologist, I'm perfectly willing to uh, what ensure that the show trial is as broadly attended to as possible. So... Anyways, I have no idea how this is going to go, Mick. 
I mean, who do I? I'm, I'm going to, oh, I wrote Trudeau. <laughs> I wrote Justin yesterday and just let him know old Justin. what was happening. Yeah, yeah. I, and said, you know, um, turns out that I'm having my professional license threatened because I don't agree with you, which I certainly don't. And uh, I just thought, you know, you might be interested in knowing that this is occurring on your watch. And so anyways, I wrote him and then I sent that to the National Post and they said they wanted to publish it as an op-ed. So I added an introductory paragraph and a concluding paragraph just to let everybody know the context. And that's going to be published tomorrow. And I know a number of reporters who are going to cover this in the next few days. And it'll get some international attention soon. And so... What do you think is going to happen? Hmm. I you think have to guess. If, I think if I had to guess, I think that they'll say, you know what, after looking into these, we realize that these are just random people on Twitter complaining and we're going to throw them, throw them out and not pursue you further. I think that's what my guess is. The alternative is they literally take your license. And I think that that's also easily possible. But it would be such a public war. And it just, it shows that their system is broken. It's obvious that the system is broken if that's what happens. If they take your license for your opinion tweets. It shows that their system is broken. I don't think that they can let that happen. And eventually someone will figure out what's happening and say, guys, you have to let this go. Somebody at the top. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know, you know, because I keep thinking that, you know, the tide will turn and this is self-correcting, but everything's self-correcting in the long run. Yeah. But, you know, when the Israelites were wandering through the desert, that was three generations. <sighs> so the long run can be a very long time and things self-corrected in the Soviet Union to some yeah. degree, but it took 60 years and, you know, 30 to 40 million deaths. And so things can fall apart pretty damn badly. And if we think we're immune to that in a place like Canada, it's just because we're, you know, so sheltered, we're naive beyond belief. It isn't clear to me at all that a third of Canadians have virtually no allegiance whatsoever to the ideas of freedom of association, allegiance, conscience, and expression. The rapidity with which Canadians, particularly in Toronto, leapt forward to adopt all the restrictions of the mask mm -hmm. mandates was absolute evidence of that. And there's still plenty of people here who are more than happy to have their masks on and who I think would wear them for the rest of their lives, especially if they had the extra delight of being, to tell, of being able to tell other people that they also had to wear them. So yeah. I don't know what'll happen, kiddo. I mean, what do I think will happen? I think, I don't think that they'll do what you said at least in the immediate no. future. Because I think they made too many decisions already to backtrack without the kind of embarrassment that should necessitate resignation. And so I think what'll happen is they'll pray devoutly that I go the hell away mm -hmm. and that I'm actually afraid of their, you know, their, uh, their public hearing, but I'm not. In fact, I'm much less afraid of that because I can represent myself then. I'm much less afraid of that than of anything we're doing presently. And so I think they'll go through with that. I think they have to, I don't know, there's two endpoints. They resign and apologize, or they walk this through and take my license. Those are the options. So I guess it depends how, how badly Canada is going to fall before it corrects itself. Because I think the universities yeah, well, are you know, dead. They, I think the universities are dead. I don't know if the, you know, doc colleges that are around for doctors, those might be dead too. So it well, can get pretty bad. You know, the, the, classic, the classic hallmark of a tyrant is that under duress, they double down. So I suspect what they'll do now is they'll release something like a public statement indicating that my vociferous attempts to defend myself are nothing but my utility of my own proclivity for bullying to bring the weight of my alt-right followers unfairly to bear on this issue. So they'll play the victim card, right? Despite the fact that, that I have left them alone 
and that the reverse isn't true. Now they'll say, well, they're just doing their professional duty. It's like, well, I guess that's what the dispute's about. I don't think you're just doing your professional duty. I think you're a pack of envious scoundrels hiding your own incompetence behind the opportunity to persecute. That's what I think. And so, you know, when you think I'm a reprehensible alt-right bully, it's like, okay, I think you're wrong about that. Let's have it out. We'll see what everyone thinks when the, when the dust settles. So I guess that's where we're at, kiddo. Yep. And we'll keep everybody posted online. And we'll link the article um, in the YouTube description. Yep. And, I'll, 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 and we'll link this document that makes all the correspondence that's relevant and legally appropriate available. <laughs>